and let it out. And take a deep breath all the way in through your nose, down through your chest, into your belly. <sighs> and this time as you breathe in, breathe in through the bottom of your where they are connected to the earth. And breathe them all up through your legs, up through your belly, and let it out. And another one. This time, as you breathe in through your feet, imagine this energy coming up through from the center of the earth, all the way up, 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 up through the bedrock, through the soil, the topsoil, up and more, and into your feet, up your legs, and into your belly. And let it And as you sit here, be aware of your connection to this earth. Be aware of all these mountains that are surrounding us and holding us, that are connecting us together from all over the country, it looks like. And the waterways that are connecting us as the water cycles around the planet. And this time breathe into your heart center and find some gratitude those mountains and those rivers and these forests that are holding us. And as you breathe in, let that gratitude grow bigger. And as you breathe out, let it fill up your whole energy bubble. One more deep breath into your heart, into that space of gratitude for all that holds us. And let it out, fill up your whole energy field. I'm on a call. And then as you're ready, feel your seat back here in your chair, feel your feet on the ground. Open up your eyes slowly and come back to the space with everybody. Carol's here from me. Beautiful, it's so good to see you all. Thank you for joining us. So for those of you who weren't here, I'm, I'm Kat um, and I'm here with Kata Brown. We're part of, of Rites of Passage Council and uh, we're here to think about an authentic life. What does it mean? to live an authentic life. And so I appreciate all of you joining us this evening. I know there's a thousand and one things you could be doing. And uh, it's important to take time out to think about that, take time out of our busy, busy schedules. So what does it really mean to live an authentic life? So I wanted to start with a, a very old story. It's just a quick one um, that could have sort of set the stage for us. Um, and there's many, many versions of this story. And I refer you to Michael Mead um, to, to hear more different versions of this story, but from across the world, I think, I can't say all cultures, many cultures have some version of this story. Um, but from the Western tradition, it was written down initially by Plato. So that was about 300 BCE. And he wrote it in the end of the Republic. And it's called the myth of Ur. And it is the story of a man who was killed in battle and uh, as people were gathering the bodies from this battle, they realized that this particular man's body hadn't decomposed after 10 days. He was still looking pretty fresh. And they were confused by that. But they put him on the funeral pyre anyway. And two days later, he woke up off his funeral pyre and he had quite a tale to tell. And when they listened to him tell his story, they heard that his soul had gone to some place after he was killed. And there was a place where there was somebody sitting in a chair and there was four channels that souls were being funneled through that they, they were going up and down and some were going down and up. They were going to the upper world and they were going to the underworld and they were coming back purified. They'd burnt off the dross from that, from that life, all the impurities collected in that life and they were now pure souls. And Ur was instructed to just watch that he wasn't gonna participate. He was there to watch and take this story back to humanity. So he watched. And as these souls were purified, they were cycled through the upper world and the underworld and they came out. And there was a meadow 
where they stayed and he stayed with this this whole group of souls for seven days in this meadow and then they were told they had to walk they were going to go on a journey and so they started walking and they walked for three whole days before way off in the distance they saw an incredible shaft of rainbow light coming down and coming down to some point in the distance and it took them another day to get there a full day of traveling and then finally they reached this place where the rainbow light hit the ground and they saw that it was the spindle of necessity and sitting there was lady necessity herself on her throne with her daughters the three fates and all the souls except for her because he wasn't to participate but all the souls were given a lottery token and told to line up according to the number on that lottery token and as they went through underneath the throne of lady necessity they were asked to choose a life and they chose a life each of them and as they chose a life they were assigned a spirit and each soul and each spirit companion walked under the throne of lady necessity and out onto the plane of oblivion you watched as all this happened all these souls with their spirit guides with them were taken went under the throne of necessity and out onto the plane of oblivion and then on the plane of oblivion, the river of forgetfulness was flowing. And each of the souls was instructed, but not error, because he was there to take this tale back. But each of them was instructed to drink to varying degrees from the river, river of forgetfulness. So some of them drank a lot. Some of them didn't drink so much, but everybody drank from the river of forgetfulness. And then as they fell asleep, air watched as their souls were lifted off and taken to different parts of the planet and they were reborn. And that's when he woke up on his funeral pyre and was able to tell the story to the rest of the humans so that we know. So it's a very, very brief, brief version of a very old story that's probably way older than, than when Plato wrote it down a couple of thousand years ago. And as I said, it does have corollaries in many, many other cultures. This idea that we are, we are here on purpose. We are here with a purpose. And uh, we have chosen this life. And that sometimes it's, well, all the times we forget. And uh, part of this journey is, is finding our way back to that, finding our way back to that life that we chose. And that our spirit guide is here with us to help us with that. Um, and all pre-industrialized earth-based peoples around the country, around the, the world had ceremonies for helping us to remember, helping us to come back to who we are and what we came here to do. And that's very close to the heart of the work that we do here at Rites of Passage Council. And so that's some of what we wanted to, to think about with you this evening. Um, my mentor, Kata Brown, who's here with me, who, who will we'll speak within a minute, has been doing these ceremonies for over 30 years now, has worked with various different traditions, and has you know, really dedicated himself over the past few decades to, to providing ceremonies for people to, to remember, to come back to, why is why are our souls here? What are we doing here? What is the purpose? Um, so I'd like to introduce Kata. Hi, Kata. You're on mute. All right. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here with you. I love that story. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of many other stories about in a similar way that <clears throat> we come here carrying medicine wow. and also carrying agreements that we made with our ancestors that also carry the same medicine. And then we come here to offer that medicine. So we'll dive a lot more into that, but I just want to say welcome. It's great to be here and see all of your faces. And uh, definitely offer my gratitude to the First Nations peoples of these mountains, the Cherokee, and also want to honor all of your ancestors in those distant places and villages that they traveled and that you traveled from to, to arrive here in this time. Well, thank you, Kat. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk to Kata for a little bit, and then we're going to 
I'll probably break out into some groups because there's quite a lot of us and I want everyone to have a chance to, to speak with somebody, which won't happen if we stay in the big group, but we'll, we'll do that in a little bit. Um, but Cater, I wanted to just ask you for your perspective on this question of living an authentic life. What does it mean for you? Um, well, you, you know, borrowing from the story, it first means remembering and uh, remembering uh, that place where your passion intersects with the needs of your people, that place where your healing medicine that you carry enters this world. So to me, be, living an authentic life is about um, remembering and connecting, being seen um, and seeing and acknowledging others. So this way of this way of belonging, um, when I think about belonging, there's a way in which the gifts that you carried and carry need to be uh, drawn out or pulled out of you or called out of you. Like the gift that you carry, no one else carries. No one else is going to deliver it the way that you would. Um, and, if it, and if you don't deliver it, then it just doesn't happen. And so this, um, this idea that we come into this world carrying a gift, carrying medicine, um, having made agreements with certain ancestral helping spirits that also carry the same medicine. And that arriving here, <laughs> we, I love we encounter this river of forgetfulness and we drink a little bit, some of us a little bit more. And, uh, and then the initiatory passages that we go through, some of them intentional, uh, some of them accidental and unintentional um, are, are uh, designed, at least the intentional ones are designed to activate the memory of these agreements that you came in with. Um, and that you also come in with uh, the a proportional amount of power to deliver the gift and the medicine that you came here to deliver. Um, so rites of passage, initiatory experiences are designed to, to activate these memories, these agreements, and, and draw them out of you. And that's what the village is for, to draw them out of you. It's, um, you know, we think about education these days as a, a method where mostly it's filling up people with information that the culture values. Um, and the word educare coming from the, or the education coming from the Latin word educare means to draw forth from within, to kind of like draw it out of the person um, so that the teacher's job is not to fill you up with uh, cultural, uh, predominant cultural myths, but to find what is your personal mythology and how do we draw that out because we need it. Um, and if you, the way I like to say it, if you're not initiated into the bone memory, into the mythology of your own life, you will likely be living an existence that is not entirely your own. And the life that you know you must live is the one standing just a few paces in front of you, looking over its shoulder with eyes wide, waiting for you to remember. And so these, uh, these initiatory experiences, and I would say, I don't count all hardships the way that some people speak of a, a, a difficult passage as an initiate, initiatory experience. It may have been, but not necessarily. Initiation means there's some shift in consciousness and shift in uh, identity and belonging and responsibility. Um, and this, and it's something we, we live into. One of the other um, that, that uh, an authentic life was something that was, that is acknowledged at the beginning when, when one shows up in this world. And I've seen this in, in uh, many different earth-based tradition cultures that still operate on the planet um, in encountering um, people or youth who had lost their way and um, and asking them a question, especially if they grew up in one of these type of communities, I would sometimes say, do you, have a, do you have another name? And interesting enough, they often would say, yes, I have another name. And uh, they would talk about going to live with an elder 
not long after being born or as a child for the purpose of receiving this other name. And in one instance, this young man from, from South Africa, I said, well, write it down for me. And he wrote down this name across the paper and I read it and it was filled with elements and features in the landscape and animals. Um, and he said, you know, when I left my village when I was eight years old, he said, uh, my grandmother told me, she said, follow your name. Um, and I said, have you been following your name? He said, no. So basically that's why I'm here in this rehab center, wilderness rehab center. I haven't been following my name. And so these, these identities of belonging and medicine is something we live into. Um, that we come into this world and the job of the village or the elders is to see that in our youth and, and as adults to begin to, to see that in each other and call it out. And are you living into, are you living into your medicine? Are you living into your name? Um, so belonging is a, is a uh, there, there's a belonging in the way that we show up in the world. Do you belong? Do you have a life of belonging, to borrow a, a David White uh, way of thinking about it? Um, do, you, do you live a life of belonging in your own skin? Um, and is the life you live right now a life of belonging? Um, and again, when you, when you, when you do find the, the crossroads of where your passion intersects with the, the needs of your people, that's where you thrive and that's where you have the most to offer. And I have found personally in my life and when I find those places, it's also the place that heals me. Um, that something deep and, and ancestral in me begins to heal when I can find that place. Um, because we're not just carrying our personal stories of belonging or not belonging. We're also carrying our ancestral stories of displacement or disconnection um, from land, from people. Um, one of the little things I like to say is like that this, this piece of sweet grass, there was a, a time long ago, if we thought of one of these strands of sweet grass as being our individual identity, and one of these strands of being our ancestral identity and one of these strands of being our uh, identity to land, to earth, to place. And for any of us in this country that aren't born in this country, these three belongings have become unwoven and fragmented like this sweet grass. And so the the, the work of Rites of Passage Council and these initiatory experiences is to take that individual belonging and begin to weave it back together with that ancestral belonging and so that weaves back together with our connection to, to nature, to land, um, to that expanded way of belonging. So those are a few things I think of with that question, Kat. Mm, thank you. Yeah, and maybe you could also tell us a little bit about the ceremonies that you've been working with over the past few decades and, and how they help people to, to see through that veil of forgetfulness and realign with their medicine or find a life of belonging, as you described. Well, first, I think there's uh, <clears throat> so rites of passage, vision fast work, um, nature connection work. Um, I think the first thing to realize is that there is, there has been a forgetfulness. Like some people might think, well, what, what do you mean forget? Um, that we, we live, first we identify the, the challenges that we live in a culture where we're constantly bombarded with stimulation and immediate gratification. And the myths that are offered up to us to ascribe to as Joseph Campbell once said, if you want to know what the myths of the greater cult culture are, is you just look around and see what the tallest buildings are, and then you'll know what the myths are. So that way, if you're not really deeply connected to your own personal mythology, then you're going to be unconsciously adapting to the 
the society myths of, of different isms. And there's you know many different isms. Um, so first, there's that recognition that when you when you go into as my, one of my teachers, uh, Stephen Foster and Meredith Little at the School of Lost Borders many, many years ago, said, if you go into nature and sit still and start to notice all the details of everything around you in your immediate space, that place will become sacred. One, because you noticed it. And two, because it notices you. And so initiatory rites of passages that we offer a way of guiding people into an experience and connection to, through ceremony with nature in a way that um, the noise in our heads begins to quiet. Um, disconnection from technology. And, uh, and then once that happens, all we're left with is the, the, the thoughts that are spinning in our head. And uh, one of my teachers, Rockingberry, used to say, he would say, you know, the job of the mind is not to run your life. The job of the mind is to record information and give it back to you when you need it or strategize a plan of action for something coming down the road. He said, other than that, the mind shouldn't be engaged. What should be engaged is your awareness to what's immediately in front of you and who's immediately in front of you. So being able to, to pay attention at that level requires our, our mind to stop moving, the thinking mind. And so when you enter into nature and into stillness and into ritual, eventually these things begin to fall away. This way of, of uh, our thinking mind engaging us. And then what rises up? Well, it's not very comfortable sometimes at first because it's all the stuff we've been squashing down. So maybe a memory, maybe a feeling, uh, maybe some gratitude. Um, but often the things that we squash down start to then come up because we're not distracting ourselves from ourself. Um, and as we go through that doorway um, of allowing that those things to move through us, those memories to come, those feelings to come. What we find on the other side is that our attention and our awareness is expanded. And, and, um, and there's connection, there's relationship. Um, so, the, um, so our programs uh, of guiding people through rites of passage experiences essentially taken through the stages of an initiatory passage. And if we just think of those stages generally being what you would call the, the calling, what brings you to it. And, it. and a calling can look very intentional and conscious, or a calling can look like a train wreck that just destroyed your life and you don't know what to do next. Um, but either way, it calls you to a different way of being. And then following the calling, there's what we call in the rite of passage language, the severance, the letting go. And that's some of what I know Kat will be talking about later. It's like, what is it that we are, that's needed to let go of so we can live the authentic life that we're here to live? Um, and so there's this letting go process um, until we get, you know, palms open, heart open, um, in a, in a quest or a fasting quest, or the belly is open. Um, and, and there's this, this open, open heart, open belly, surrendered place of, 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 uh, of what I say welcomes, the, the place that can welcome grace, because you can't choreograph grace. Um, but you can prepare yourself for, for its entry by surrendering and letting go. Um, and so in these experiences in nature, uh, uh, first getting nature connected and, and dropping some of the old things that are going through our heads. And then, um, and then the severance part of things rising up again, memories and feelings and things that we haven't thought of or dealt with. And then as we stay through that, then there's this letting go. And, uh, you know, on our website, we have it on the front page. It says, uh, great journeys often begin in darkness. 
they begin with, I don't know. I don't know what to do. That's when the great journeys begin. They don't begin with the light, with sunrise and with clarity. That comes after. Where they begin is in the dark, in the not knowing, um, in that surrendered place. And so in doing that in connection with nature, um, we become authentically familiar to those that live in the natural world. I can't tell you how many times uh, I've heard a story about a bear or an eagle or a mountain lion or a squirrel or a mouse or a, or a blue heron. Like when a person is in that state of authentic openness, these animals come in close and, and people say, well, why, why is it they, they come in close when we're doing ceremony? How is it that they just right at these certain moments, they show up? And the only thing I can think of is like somehow we have become authentically familiar to them and they recognize us as being one of them. And so animals often come in close and they have these, these uh, grand experiences or encounters that seem quite synchronistic. Um, so the road to authenticity is, is one um, often a beginning with that calling, again, intentional or unintentional and accidental. And then there's a slow severance process that can be intentional or, or accidental where everything that we feel connected to in our life just seems to be going and, and we can't stop it. Um, and the other thing important about that we help people see is, you know, having a background myself in, in clinical psychotherapy, along with all of this other way of working in the world, is that the old paradigms of uh, wellness tend to pathologize the mythological journey. Um, so that when, when we're going through what I would call a soul descent, um, often this is not a time to be pathologized or medicated or, or put somewhere. Um, or go, go visit people who are just better at disguising their own difficulties than we are. It's a time where we need a guide to say, oh, you're in a soul descent. You need guides to help you navigate this territory. Um, and so that's what I see the purpose of rites of past council guides or, or soul guides or people that have gone on those descents over and over in their own lives and find the passion in other people navigate the territory of the unknown and sometimes the unknowable. Um, and so these, uh, so in a in a we have a we have cats weekend, which is a, a immersion, an, an initial immersion into nature connection and mindfulness and and, and ceremony, and then you have uh, we have an eleven day uh, vision quest encampment that includes many other things, but within it there's a four day four night uh, solo ritual ceremony, um, and and many other things that we'll talk about later, but. Let's say the, the role of, of, of a guide is more of a ceremonial midwife. Um, there's nothing we're giving to anybody that they don't already have. We're just trying to shine a light in those places where they can see it. Thank you, Kater. I'm, I'm thinking about this soul descent idea and um without pathologizing and using the language of pathology, um, what are the clues for someone that they're in a soul descent or that they're... Ah. You know, that... <laughs> <laughs> Looks like this. <laughs> um, yeah, it can look like, you know, many things it can look like, as I say, this, this phrase, I don't know what to do is a clue. When you've reached the end of your own resourcefulness and intellectual strategizing, and, and feel utterly uh, kind of broken open and lost, you're definitely, you've already stepped over the precipice of Soul Canyon. Um, and, and it can look like um, in a descent, in a lot of the mythology stories that, that uh, um, like in the one that Kat told where the river is also the place of forgetting. 
but it also in many stories, going to the bottom of a river or going into water is a place of remembering. So you actually go into the elemental territory to access and, and, and activate the memory. So in a descent, in stories of initiatory descent, you'll often hear in the story this trajectory that goes down into water. Um, and being carried down into water is being carried down into the, um, the land of healing and reconciliation of belonging and ancestral wounding um, and memory and deep emotion. Um, and so this, this descent um, is the, the preparation, if you will, for the ascent. Um, and there's no avoiding it. Uh, those of you who look old enough to have been on the planet long enough know that <laughs> you're not going to be able to avoid this, this uh, scenario. Um, so it's best to have a good guide that can help you mythologize the journey and, and cultivate your own personal mythology out of it. Because um, that's what's happening in the descent. Um, is you're, you're, you're cultivating allies, you're cultivating wisdom, you're cultivating direction and clarity. Um, but it, it, it does begin with, uh, a surrender and, um, and then what it looks like down at the bottom of, of that, uh, descent can be quite varied. Um, and having a container to hold it, I think is what's key. We don't have a society we have not being in a hospital and being in a hospital or being in therapy, which you only get an hour or so there a week at best. Um, but a large enough container that can hold the descent. And I think those are the more extended uh, experiences where ritual and ceremony begin hold the process and, and hold it in a way of trusting that there's something organically unfolding here. Um, and my job is not, not to get in the way, but also to support what's trying to happen. Um, it also so can look like feeling suicidal. We get straight to that one. Um, often when I've had people come to me and talk about feeling suicidal and I'll listen to their story and I'll say, yes, something does need to die, but it is not you. And that's a, that's a pathologizing of the mythological descent. There's some way of being, believing, thinking, doing, relating that can no longer go on. And it's important not to confuse that with you. Um, these, uh, I call them old ways of loving that no longer work. Um, and these things have to be shed like, the, like a snake sheds its skin. Like we have to shed these things and, and enter that place of, uh, of openness. Um, or the betwixt in between the threshold phase, that time in the solo when people think about, um, like when you hear the word vision quest, people think about that time on the, like the solo part of it, the, in the woods, the four days and nights, or however long it happens to be. And I think, oh, that's, that's actually the easy part. <laughs> the hard part is getting there and the other hard part is returning from there. Um, so in that threshold phase in the middle place, it can look like um, wandering, you know, it can look like, uh, a 24 year old who wants to travel the world. Yeah, get out there. If you can get out there and see it, you know, do that, go experience it. Um, like they're in this, this wandering phase, which also happens when we have uh, things that end in our lives, we enter a threshold. And, and the tendency I think in this culture is to hurry and get through the threshold, um, to treat thresholds like a door seal where you just kind of step across it. And in fact, thresholds can last weeks or months or years, um, but how we navigate the threshold is what's important. Because when we're in the threshold, that's the place where you connect with the sacred. That's the place where you connect with that intuitive nudging this way and that way. Um, and, it, and it's outside of our you know, cultural demands or society demands for how to be um, when you find yourself in that threshold phase. And then it can look like the return phase when you're coming back from the journey um, and trying to fit back into a life that you've outgrown. 
it's like um, I like to say that you're you you step back into a life um, or the thing that's been calling you forward in your life is unconcerned with the comforts of the life you have outgrown. It just calls you forward. It's not really concerned with those comforts. Um, and so when you return from that, you come back into a place that's asking something different of you uh, in order to, your, your way of belonging is now different. And, uh, and that can be difficult too. If you've ever returned from one of these experiences and go back into a life where you don't fit the old story anymore. Um, and the people in the old story would prefer that you did a lot of times and want you to go back. <laughs> And that can be challenging. Um, and then there'll be others that see some light, some uh, see Andronima burning in your eyes and say, hey, where did you go and how do I get some of that? Where's the trailhead to that place? Um, and then others will simply fade away. So the, the, the return is quite challenging too. So that, that whole process of calling severance threshold return, um, can be quite rich and powerful, um, which are very different words than fun and entertaining <laughs> that way uh, that people seek in our culture a lot. Anyway, I know I'm, uh, Kat knows I have a tendency to go down rabbit holes and so I'm gonna pause here. <laughs> Thank you, Kata. I'm, and I'm sure this is stirring things for each of you. So we wanna give you a chance to to think for yourselves, like what does this, what does this really mean? I'm going to post two questions in the chat um, to, to think about what does it, what does it mean to live an authentic life, and what would you personally need to let go of to step into your authentic life or to have a life of belonging, as Kate was referring to it. Um, so I want to give us chance to to break out into smaller rooms so we can actually talk with one another. But I wanna set a few sort of parameters around that. Um, so the, the intention was to, to think about these two questions for ourselves. These will be rooms of maybe three, four, maybe five people at the most. Um, and the, the intention is just to create a, a place to, to share what's, what's on your heart and what comes to your mind as you think about you stepping into an authentic life or your path, wherever you are in that path. Um, so re requesting that you you hold you just listen you listen to people as they speak maybe just what order you're going to go in and each person share and everyone else just just listen listen with compassion listen with non-judgment it's not a space to to give advice or to try and solve people's problems we're not going to do that in the next 12 minutes just just to listen just to witness this this other human's um journey and where they are in this soul descent are they teetering on the edge of soul canyon looking at it or are they already are they already in are they down at the bottom are they on the way up just just listen to each people's story and and what what for each of you means it means to live an authentic life um we'll take maybe 15 minutes max to do this and then come back um and then i'd love to hear whatever came out of that and also open it up for questions um, to cater if you have specific questions for he and I, um, we'd love to, to hear a little bit from each of you. Anyone have any questions before I, I start shuffling people into breakout groups and it'll be random. You'll just, I don't have any control over who goes with who. What were the two questions for these groups? I posted them in the chat. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Can you see it? Uh, what does it mean to live an authentic life? And what would you personally need to let go of to step into your authentic life or to have a life of belonging? I'm going to create eight rooms. There should be four to five people per room. All right. And at any point, I think you should put a little button in the way you could call us. So for some reason you have a question, or we can we can pop in and come visit with you. Otherwise, we'll see you back here in probably 12 or 13 minutes. All right, so you'll get a, you should get a little thing that you just, just allow you to pop out into the breakout room.
still got some people here. Is that awesome. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. It was great. I was thanking uh, Kita. I hope I said your name right. Um, for allowing so many goddesses in this room. <laughs> and um, the importance of the goddess mentality, the circular thinking is what you spoke. And that's correct. That's what the earth needs at this moment. Um, in order to heal her, we have to sustain her. In order to go for the next generations not born, we have to think about being in the circle. We're not the only ones that inhabit this earth. I'm preaching to the choir, that I know. But it's good to hear it again. It's good to hear it strong. And uh, such a great gathering of beautiful souls is always a good thing with good intention. So I thank you for uh, being in the forefront of that. And I thank Kat for your your elegance in your speaking and how you present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? We'd love to hear as many voices as possible. Carmen. Sure, you're... There you go. Um, you know, this is just some kind of realization I'm having as I hear you and uh, Kate talk about this, this thing about authenticity. And, and what comes to mind is that I really need acceptance. I need acceptance of myself and of the situation that I might be in the way it is in the here and now. Um, because I don't really have a frame of reference of what it is like to be authentic. Uh, maybe I did when I was like, uh, you know, in my hippie days in the, in the early seventies, uh, where I had an idea of what being authentic was, which was based on Expressing my my feelings, not putting any you know any limitation to whatever I wanted to express. Um, but you know that was I'm not gonna say how many years ago that was, but but right now I think acceptance is really important because I only exist in the here and in the now, that's all I have, that's all I am, and that's all that's happening. So perhaps, you know, in the seeking for authenticity, sometimes maybe I'm stepping away from actually just being, you know, which is a really wonderful way of being authentic is, is simply being. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you this evening and thank you very much for hosting this wonderful event. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah, beautiful observation. Thank you. Yeah. Con Conrad. Yeah, um, so I, uh, I retired from a career in Maryland and um, I specifically came out to this area for this this kind of work, and I was um, very grateful to um, find Cater and um, be able to do a few grief rituals with him. And um, for me, um, being authentic is um, fulfilling uh, my passion and what feeds me, and and it is um, service. And um, uh, it. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to look um, in in this area and and in my next part of my life, but I think this is a critical step um, for me to help identify that and clarify it. And um, just from the uh, groups that I've attended and the beautiful communities that I've connect connected with, um, it's provided so many resources now that are beginning to feed me and. Um, I really truly think the um, 
uh, you know, it's endless possibilities. But um, I shared a, a room with um, Bear and uh, Wendy. And um, what I loved is um, Wendy made a, um, uh, an observation and um, she shared like when I was talking and sharing uh, what it meant to me, she could feel the passion in my voice. And, 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 and really that's what it is when I'm doing what I love and what I really feel authentic for, it just, it gives me life. And um, so I'm just, um, I'm just happy to be with the group and um, to be able to take the next steps and just kind of really clarify, you know, the path. Thank you, Conrad. All right, you're welcome. Andrea, I see you have your hand up. So I feel like, um, Part of, like right now, I'm definitely in a threshold. I left Asheville um, in June, May or June, um, and travel and started traveling. And I'm towards the ends of my travel, and I really don't know what to do with myself right now. Um, and you know, it's like looking at settling in somewhere for the winter or forever. Who knows? You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of things unknown, um, and I really don't know right now what I, I need to stay in my authenticity, especially with what's happening right now around us. Um, and I'm kind of freaking out, but I don't want to be freaking out because I know it's a good thing. And I know whenever there's like this like breakdown and I'm like in this place of like total overwhelm and like crying all the time, that it just means that something amazing is going to like be on the other side of it. And that it's just uncomfortable right now. Um, but I would love any help in like identifying what is needed to help stay there, especially with, you know, this current situation of being um, transitory. Thank you, Andrea. Nick. Oh, yeah, Andrea, I just, just, I just wanted to say something to Andrea Cato, which was that just really appreciating your, your acknowledgement of where you are and not, I don't, I'm not hearing a huge like urgency to like, to fix it, you know, to like, change, you're just acknowledging where you are. And I think that's really the, the first step is to, is to be present with it as Carmen was saying, be present with with where you are and what you're experiencing and that to trust that the in that and so it is. Yeah. Who who is next, Nick? Yeah, hi. Um yeah, I just wanted to say I've lately felt um yeah quite broken and lost <laughs> uh, in my my own way, I suppose. Um and, and feeling like, you know, on a soul level, I don't belong, but sort of coming slowly to this realization that like belonging has in it longing. And so this, this like sinking into a place of, of really deep longing and a lot of the, what I guess I would call spiritual language that I've encountered for me there's on some level or something that I bring to it, like doesn't allow for that longing, you know, it's like you should transcend the longing, like get, get over the longing, but to really be realizing that like, Oh, that longing is my, you know, like my soul speaking and to trust that longing is really like opening these doors that are so beyond me. And so like connecting that, um, and it's quite um, sorrowfully beautiful. So I just wanted to, bring that forth too yeah thank you so yeah important. thank you nick yeah leaning into that that longing it's an, an old saying called follow the longing and um in fact when i listen to you nick and you andrea uh, i think of a ritual prescription comes to mind to if you could even create a day to go into nature and follow your longing and wonder, like to mark a time at 
like a medicine walk at sunrise and to mark entry into this time of intentional ceremonial wandering and not knowing. And in that intentional wandering and not knowing, pay attention to everything that you encounter, that you experience it, and because you're, you're starting uh, uh, with that kind of intentional stepping into it in a ceremonial way, you're activating or starting a conversation with the sacred in which you're paying attention at a, at a, at a much more subtle level and, um, and letting yourself not know and letting yourself wonder um, and, and be in it. Um, to not, uh, like not knowing is a place, wandering is a place. These aren't no places where you need to be somewhere else. These are very, actually very sacred places. And to, to um, not cave to societal pressures of, of feeling like there has to be, I have to figure out what to do or how to be. It's like step into it as a ceremony and, and live into that longing in a medicine walk for a whole day or the question, I don't know, or that statement. And just notice what you encounter, what comes up, um, but to really embrace what is and what, what will be will naturally follow. Do you have any recommendations of like, how would you start that ceremony? Like, is it just kind of what you're feeling in the moment or is there any powerful phrasing or way that you would initiate that? I would personally go to a place in nature around sunrise and I would delineate either with a stick or a circle, something on the ground that I'm gonna step across and into. And it, before I stepped across, I would speak an invocation, or one might call it a prayer or a gratitude. Um, thank you, ancestors, for assisting me in this wandering, assisting me in holding this place of not knowing and really deepening into it. You know, thank you, Creator, for all the, uh, the, the other than human world that will join me in this experience today. Um, and I might, you know, make an offering to the to the land there, and some water, some cornmeal, or uh, as a, a, a reciprocity that when I'm going somewhere to ask for something, that there be a reciprocity of relationship. Maybe even a little bit of honey on and sesame seed for on a stump for the bear or something, um, and then step in. And, and let yourself be where you are and pay attention to everything. Um, and then at the end of the day, and take your journal and take some water, let somebody know where you're gonna be and when you're gonna come out, those basic safety measures. And um, take, your, yeah, take your journal and some water. If, you can, if, you're, uh, if you're not at any, any health concerns for fasting, I would fast during the day. <clears throat> and when at the end of the day, come back to that same place and make an offering and, and another offering and say, thank you. Um, and then step out across the stick or through the threshold, whatever threshold you make at that place. Um, and then treat whatever you wrote in your journey as a, as a, a chapter of your own mythology. Like everything in there that you're, you're looking at will show up in your writing, will show up in the, your encounters in nature. Um, like everything in your experience will have medicine to offer you. Um, and it's taken time to be with it, that uh, to be seen and see. Um, one of the things I liked about when I'm hearing about this, this thing about what authenticity needs is someone to see them. And when we feel seen, it just comes out. Um, and nature does that. Nature sees us. Um, so it's a, it's a suggestion of a, of a way to be in that threshold phase intentionally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have two hands up. So Audra, do you want to jump in with your question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to piggyback, I guess, off of what um, Andrea shared, because I've been in Asheville, um, planning to leave and travel. And 
um, very much not knowing what to do, where to go, mm -hmm. and navigating a lot of unexpected changes along the way. Um, I started planning this trip in, I think, like March or April when I found out I was losing my housing and um, I tried to kind of like fight to keep my housing and that wasn't going to be a thing. And I could have looked for other housing, but um, <clears throat> I decided to, to buy a vehicle, um, like a little camper vehicle, um, which took me several months to find. But now I've, I've been living in this vehicle for the past two months. And due to whatever variables and my own indecision, I'm still here in Asheville and I haven't like fully crossed the threshold because there's been so much not knowing and so much unknown and, and the decision fatigue of just navigating a challenging lifestyle of living in a vehicle. I didn't realize that that's just a daily thing, let alone the overwhelm of trying to make a bigger uh, thing happen. Um, I can really relate to like having gone through a process of like, like feeling like I should be somewhere, like I should be doing something different or I should know what to do. And finally just like surrendering to like, it's okay not to know um and then yeah but at, but at what point like I don't know I, I was sick last week like a stomach thing from moldy food in the van and um like I'm like at what point is like enough enough and I do need to make a decision because in that moment that I was really sick I was like something's got to change I can't keep living in a van and mold season in Appalachia like I need to follow through and go to the desert or like do something different um yeah, but I don't know what that something is like strongly enough. I don't have like a drive toward anything really. <laughs> or if I do, there's like an equal uncertainty that's like pulling me in another direction. Yeah, thank you, Audra. Yeah. Sounds like the same, the same ritual might be calling for you too. Yeah, yeah, so it was timely to hear that. I took notes for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and appreciate you being willing to to sit in the unknowing and yeah. just let that whatever that does to you, but it will it will do something. Yeah, thanks. When yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, I just want to add on a, a few things and things that that came from my heart in listening to Nick. Um, first of all and you spoke of sort of this, you know, in the spiritual world or practices of this ascending belonging. And I, I think we have to be, in my opinion, very careful. I, I run into a lot of this in spiritual circles of, you know, ascend the ego, ascend this, ascend that. And we have to be so careful that we're not just spiritually bypassing something that is so necessary to experience. And, and to me, belonging, that is our root. That, that is so tightly woven in our bone memory and our DNA that by belonging to tribe, that is how we once survived. You know, we were in the village. You, you, you got the moose, whatever it was. It wasn't mine. It became the villages. This was that sense of belonging connected to something that is so basic to who we are today. So I don't think the longing ever goes away. It's, we are wired to belong to a tribe of some sort. And then to add on in total echoing what Kadar said, to, to go out in nature because she hears, she sees, she knows. And see what comes to you, just sit there and watch who moves in because it's going to tell you a lot about the energetics and what's going on but also her picking up what do you need and what is your authenticity you know the other beings the non-human beings vibrate at a much higher frequency than we do therefore that's why it's so healing to us to be among the plants and and our, our non-human um companions in that way and keep a journal and all the things that Kadar said reciprocity um you know in the Peruvian culture that's Aini we are always in ceremony we are always giving receiving giving receiving so when you are there do the blessings 
and the offerings, whatever it may be, and just observe and listen and feel who comes to you, what elements come to you, what birds come to you, what animals, smell, open up all the senses, um, because I think within there you'll find a lot of answers and um, beautiful session. And, and this is belonging, being part of this circle. This is belonging big time. So I, I, it, it just goes to my heart when people feel they don't belong because most of us on this call probably feel we don't fit in. Well, there's some things we're not supposed to fit into, but we are fitting in in this circle and being authentic and take that into your heart. So thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Kadar. Wonderful to see you again. Good to see you again, Wendy. Much love. Uh, I want to, as we're, we're coming to the, the top of the hour here, we're going to have a couple more <clears throat> if you have questions for Kadar, but I want to just quickly tell you about a, a couple of things we've got coming up. Um, for those of you that are feeling the call um, to step more into this work, we are coming to the, to the end of our season. We tend to stop working in the woods anyway around about November because it gets a little chilly up here in the mountains. Um, but we've got a couple more programs before the end of this season. And of course, we've got a whole year next year. Uh, but I want to tell you about a, a weekend program that I'm doing October 8th through 10th. So it's a Friday through Sunday. It's called The Road Ahead and Awakening the Wild Heart. And it's a, a small group program here on my forest farm. I'm in Marshall. It's just a little bit north of Asheville, where we, we really focus in on we, a lot of the things we've talked about today about really connecting with nature, connecting with each other, sharing our authentic selves. I'm working with the theme of, of our wild selves and our domestic selves. So we do some so a lot of work around bringing our wild selves out and how does that fit with our domestic self and, and reconciling those two in the modern world, and which often looks like more connecting with our, our wilder self. So that's happening October 8th to 10th. I'm going to post the I have a link to the thing which I'll post in the in the chat here and then Cater is also he's at a full um, schedule of vision this year he's got one more left um, in Spain which and the dates for that Cater are um, the same is October um, 12 to 23 in Cadiz Spain southern Spain um, it's a 12 day encampment, um, including, you know, severance phase and threshold phase. Um, with a, within that 12 days, there's a four day, four night solo period out on the land. Um, and so that'll be in Southern Spain. We've got, uh, I think three spots open left in that program. Um, so I think that other than training groups, which are kind of ongoing, that wraps up the year. Um, and then next, next year, yeah, we'll have a full schedule with another of uh, Kat's uh, The Road Ahead and Awakening the Wild Heart. Um, we'll have uh, here in the Asheville area, a couple of um, Vision Quest programs uh, in May and April. And I know I um, haven't seen it yet. I'm excited to see this proposal that just showed up on my computer from CAT and a couple of the other Rites of Passage Council staff that have put together um, a women's quest um, that will do some, uh, uh, that's a, I guess it's some online meeting, some online preparation that will culminate into um, uh, a nature immersion solo threshold experience. Um, and then we'll have more, more things overseas for those of you that are in the, in the EU or UK over in that area. Um, they're not yet on the calendar, but we'll, we'll get them out there here probably within the next month for next year. Um, so there'll be probably three or four quest programs in the Asheville area, and then a couple of international ones and then there's the, you heard, uh, I think Conrad mentioned the ancestral grief ritual. We did a couple of those this summer. Um, those are really powerful experiences. They're very, they're shorter, like a Thursday to Sunday, usually, you know, 25 to 35 people at one of those kind of experiences. Um, 
So those are some of the, the upcoming things for next year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I would encourage you to, if you're not sure you want to do the whole 11 day immersion into the vision quest, I would invite you to, to drop into to cat's weekend as a way to enter into the conversation with nature and the sacred. Thank you, Kata. Um, any questions? Anyone got, we've got a few more minutes. If anyone's got questions for Kata or just comments, anything you want to add in? Not a question. I just want to say deep gratitude and thank you for creating this uh, sacred circle space and seeing and meeting new faces. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. And on a personal note, Tony, your drum was the drum that called the questers to the fire at the very beginning of the of the quest. So I just want to let you know it, it was it went immediately into community use. <laughs> <laughs> I just knew it. Thank you, Cater, for sharing that. Awesome. Yeah, Conrad. Um, Kat, do you know the um, arrival times for the eighth through the tenth? What that uh, schedule is the timing yeah we start at 4 p.m on friday the 8th okay and I'll you back to your car by noon on sunday the 10th all right thank you i just wanted to share something about that i shared in the room of four but also something that's just been present in my life having done a quest and a medicine walk um, and some other things, recognizing the importance of, uh, for someone who has historically, meaning myself, repressed uh, a lot of emotions and feelings, the importance of that work too, and how that, um, yeah, that, that both the quest and the walk have helped. And I've sort of come back to how have I sometimes muscled through things um, so just anyone out there that, that resonates with, I just wanted to share that as well. I'm sort of in this process of, of learning how to feel, having suppressed that a lot in my life. So I just wanted to put that out there for um, anybody that that might resonate with. Well, Matthew, thank you. Any other thoughts or comments, Romulus? We can't hear you. Yes, yes now you can hear me. I unmuted. Yes. Um, the gift of the dark angel. There is such a thing as the gift of the dark angel. So those of you who are uncomfortable at this time have faith. The universe loves you. The mother earth loves you. Even if we've been nasty to her, she loves us. And we have to write it, write it, we have to make it right. But the universe does love you. And there is a gift in your suffering. Just mm -hmm. hold tight and, and be aware. Just as you go out to nature and you sit and listen, sit and listen to your discomfort at this point. It, it, if you let it happen, it will happen. And love, open heart, open mind, it will change things. Mm. Aho. Thank you. Milta. Lib Libby's got a hand up. I don't know if anybody else does. It is Milta, but yeah, either one. Uh. Milta, do you want to jump in? I just wanted to uh, say much gratitude to the two of you. Um, this is uh, such a a, a wonderful thing to be able to be in community when we live so far away. Uh, it would be nice if we were all in Asheville and could, you know, all sit around your circle and, and join you all the time, but we don't and we can't. And uh, this, is, this is feeding souls all over the world, I'm sure. And thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Libby. Thank you, Libby. You're quite welcome. Milta? Uh, yes, I, I just had a question. Um, you guys are in the early stages of um, planning the women's uh, immersion? Yeah, 
the women's program will have, will start probably around about February of next year uh, with some online things where the the actual solo time on the land will be in September and we'll, there'll be multiple pieces of it as we go through so the idea is to is to find a group of women that want to stay in that in that circle so we create a women's circle that will last for nine months fantastic and thank you thank you Kader and thank you Kat um I I really enjoy uh, just really um just deep gratefulness for um for this time I, mm -hmm. I mean, I see so many beautiful faces and people, and it's great. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing your voice and your uh, heart. All of thank you as well. Yeah, so we've come to the end of our time. Thank you so much to everybody for, for being present, for being present with each other, for bringing your, your true selves and your authentic feelings and your wisdom. It's so good, as Kato was saying uh, earlier on, this isn't about us telling you what we think. This is about hearing from from people and hearing our experiences that enriches all of us so thank you so much for participating yeah. well we're going to wrap up and head our respective ways and hope to see you somewhere around the fire circle maybe on one of the storytelling so yeah. winter or bye everyone we'll find Good night everyone Look forward bye. To thank you, all. you. Night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye, Romeo. <laughs> Bye, Doug. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks for from myself and Victoria. Bye bye. Thank you Thank so you much. Doug. All right. Bye. Thank you, Kendra. Bye, Victoria. Yeah. Bye bye. See you. Let's stop the recording. <laughs>